Chapter 5 Integration The Dilemma of Inclusion Without Power Today there are two Negro organized leagues just at the threshold of emergence as real financial factors. Organized Negro baseball is a million dollar business. To kill it would be criminal and that's just what the entry of their players into the American and National Leagues would do. Wendell Smith 1943 My junior season at Morgan State began in Pittsburgh on September 12th, 1970. For the third year in a row, we opened our season with Grambling. Yankee Stadium was being renovated, so the third annual Whitney Young Classic was played at Three Rivers Stadium, home of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Black college football was gearing up for another outstanding season. One of the many barometers of the program's success or of a league success was the number of players drafted by professional teams. By this measure, the National Football League Spring Draft marked yet another stellar showing for the nation's historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs. 135 athletes from 31 schools were drafted. Two players, Kenny Burroughs from Texas Southern and Ray Chester from Morgan, were first-round picks. A number of schools had multiple draftees. Grambling had eight players drafted, bringing to 17 the number of Grambling players drafted over two years. Tennessee State had five draftees, 12 in two years. John C. Smith University in North Carolina had four, followed by three Morgan players. Ray Chester by Oakland, Mark Washington by Dallas, and George Knock by the Jets. There had been a strong HBCU presence in the recently played Super Bowl III as well, where the New York Jets pulled off a stunning upset of the Baltimore Colts in 1969. The Jets roster included Johnny Sample and Emerson Boozer from Maryland State, Winston Hill from Texas Southern, and Verlon Biggs from Jackson State. The Colts had Willie Richardson from Jackson State. The HBCU influence on pro football came into full focus when the National Football League announced its 75th anniversary team. Of the 48 players selected, seven, roughly 13%, were from HBCUs. Two of them, Roosevelt Brown and Willie Lanier, were from Morgan. We didn't realize it that September afternoon in 1970, but the world of black college football was about to undergo a dramatic and traumatic transformation. While we were playing our game against Grambling, a drama was unfolding that same afternoon in Birmingham, Alabama, where the University of Southern California, USC, was playing the University of Alabama. On September 12, 1970, USC traveled to Birmingham to take on Bear Bryant's Crimson Tide at Legion Field. For many of the white and black fans at Legion Field that day, USC must have seemed like a team from the distant future. Although USC had a lot of brothers on the team, the Trojans were not merely desegregated. The team was fully integrated numerically, but more important, stylistically. Jimmy Jones, a black man with a towering afro, was USC's quarterback at a time when African Americans at predominantly white universities rarely played quarterback. But the star of the afternoon was Sam Cunningham, a six foot three inch 245-pound sophomore fullback who spent the afternoon running up and down the chest of Bryant's defense. Cunningham rushed his way into immortality that afternoon. He became the Paul Bunyan of the game's lore. Playing in his first varsity game for USC, Cunningham carried the ball 11 times, gained 135 yards, and scored two touchdowns. USC crushed Alabama 42-21. Cunningham would be called the catalyst for integration in the South. And the game drove home the point that George Wallace's June 1963 proclamation, quote, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, would have to be modified to accommodate the great black athlete. The irony of Cunningham's stardom and notoriety is that of all USC's black players, Cunningham was probably the least wrapped up in the social significance of the game. Unlike many of his teammates who were from the South, 
Cunningham did not understand the social significance of USC's playing Alabama in Alabama with a team packed with black players. He was raised in Santa Barbara, California, in an integrated community full of blacks, whites, browns, and yellows. Cunningham and I were the same age. He was born in August 1950, and I was born in September. On September 12, 1970, we were 20 years old, and our experiences in sports illuminated the rapidly changing and complex racial terrain for African Americans. But unlike Cunningham, I was born in segregated South Side Chicago and attended a historically black college in Maryland on a football scholarship. Despite my emerging social and political consciousness, the implications of USC's playing Alabama in Birmingham escaped me. Cunningham also didn't immediately grasp the significance of the game. He certainly didn't expect to become a cultural lightning rod. When we finally met 32 years later at Cunningham's home in Inglewood, California, he said the weight of the game unfolded like a flower, petal by petal. It was just one more game. At the time, it was just a football game, he said. The black-white angle that had so many reporters and his USC teammates in an uproar was lost on Cunningham. Playing with white ball players was what we did as kids, Cunningham said. Neighbors and friends, that's what it was. Cunningham said that when he landed in Birmingham, he was so consumed by the prospect of playing in his first game that everything else was a blur. He remembered hearing the coaches tell the players not to leave the hotel for fear of what might happen given the racial tension of the moment. I'm a sophomore. I'm not a star on this team. Not a leader on this team. I'm not anything, he said. I had no animosity in my heart toward these people. There was no premeditation of going out here and changing the world. Nothing. It was just a football game. My very first varsity football game. I was hyped behind that. First road trip, I didn't have a clue what was going to happen. I didn't even know I was going to play, other than on special teams. During the walkthrough practice the Friday before the game, Cunningham began to understand the significance of the game. There were 5,000 people watching the Trojans practice. In the stands, fans were talking trash. Bear is going to get him some meat. While Cunningham battered the Crimson Tide, the speedy Clarence Davis peppered USC with an assortment of darting runs and pass receptions that underlined the Crimson Tide's lack of speed. Alabama may not have needed to get blacker, but it needed to get faster, and if the two were synonymous, so be it. The USC-Alabama game spawned a number of myths. This would be Bryant's last all-white football team. Though the game did not cause him to immediately reverse his all-white recruiting philosophy and go out and begin signing every highly touted black athlete in Alabama. In fact, Bryant had already signed Wilbur Jackson in December 1969 out of Carroll High School in Ozark, Alabama. Because of a National Collegiate Athletic Association rule prohibiting freshmen from competing, Jackson did not play his first game until 1971. Still, the loss to USC did not give Bear Bryant religion in terms of recruiting black players. One of the myths that arose from the game was that after it was over, Bryant took Cunningham from the USC locker room, brought him to the Alabama locker room, and had him stand on a bench. Then he supposedly said, quote, Now that's a football player. That's a myth, Cunningham said. Although it is hard to say it is a myth because it's been told so many times. I think one of the coaches made that story up. I'm not sure which one. I do know that Coach McKay would never have let that happen. He's not going to let one of his players parade over there. That would be rubbing it in their faces. That's just part of all the lore, all the fallout. A number of Cunningham's white teammates years later would make the game larger than life. John Papadakis, a senior on that 1970 USC team, wanted to make a movie of the USC-Alabama game. Papadakis and a few others interested in doing the documentary asked Cunningham to look at the script. They were all hyped about it, Cunningham said. Finally, I told them, John, I kind of like to remember it 
as it was, not as you guys may want to make it. Every time I sit down and talk about it, which is not a lot, I try to remember it as close to how it was happening that day because that's how it happened. If I sit up and let the 30 years creep into my brain about what has happened since then, I lose perspective. Another school of thought about the game is that Bryant knew USC was a much stronger team, but felt that the only way he could make a case for integrating his program was to have his team humiliated by a Trojan team that was heavily laden with black players. Cunningham doesn't completely dismiss this idea. The powers that be who set the game up must have known that something was going to happen. Fortunately, it happened to help the Bear get what he needed to get. In fact, what stung Alabamans more than Cunningham and what escalated the tide of change was the performance of Clarence Davis, the Trojan's senior tailback, who was born in Alabama. He was born in Bessemer, right outside of Birmingham. His family moved to New York in 1958, then moved to California two years later. Davis was 14 years old in 1963 when a bomb ripped through the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, killing four girls and stunning the nation. Davis's mother knew the mother of one of the children. The public's fascination with his return to Birmingham seven years later, playing for USC, reflected their ambivalence toward black people, which became more troublesome as black athletes became more prominent and more vital to the sport. The peculiar fascination with Davis reflected the way sports-crazed Southerners were struggling with race. On the one hand, they were steeped in the white South's revulsion at the presence of blacks, but on the other, they couldn't suppress their admiration of and need for the black physical presence. It was writ large in the South in 1966, but it's a paradigm that continues to define the dilemma of race and racism in sports in the United States. Behind the cheering often lurks angry resentment. The person who may have derived the most enjoyment out of the afternoon was Davis's mother, Maria Davis. She flew from California to watch, to bask in the excitement of a game that many blacks in Alabama thought would never happen. It was her first trip back to the state she left in 1958. I was excited. I was happy, she recalled. Mrs. Davis understood what she was watching, what it meant, why this game was so important. She wanted to save her every second. It was a very important game for me, she said. When we lived there, you couldn't play a white team, she recalled. You played black schools. To look, to see how the changes had come, that was something. Maria Davis was born in Livingston, Alabama on October 8, 1929. She was five years old when her family moved to Birmingham. Mrs. Davis had tried to shield her son as much as possible from the mental scourge of segregation. That meant avoiding public transportation as much as possible. We always had a car, Mrs. Davis said. When we went places, we were in the car, and they were too small to know how the people were there, how the blacks had certain places to sit. They never experienced that. They were too small to wonder why the whites didn't go to the same school they went to. Her schools were all black. She had to sit in the back of the bus. When Clarence was born, he never rode the bus, but one time in his life, back there in the South, he didn't know about this because we moved to New York. She was a housewife in Birmingham. Her husband didn't allow her to work. He was a good provider, Mrs. Davis said. We had our difficulties, which I didn't want my children to be involved in. The USC-Alabama game was the second time Clarence Davis had returned to Alabama since he was seven. He'd come back for his father's funeral at age 16. The people wanted to see him because this was his home, and he was playing with SC. The team stayed out in the suburbs. They couldn't come out of the rooms. The food was served in their rooms, Mrs. Davis recalled. The USC team stayed at a Holiday Inn outside of Birmingham. Mrs. Davis remembers getting involved in some trash talking with one of the employees, the window washer. He said, I don't know why y'all here. We're going to beat your butts. She told him if USC lost, she would come back and wash windows. 
the white people were booing them and booing them. When they got on the bus on the way to the game, they had to have security guards. When the game was going on, it was terrible, she recalled. Some people were hollering things like, Nigger, go back to California. Nigger, go back. Just dirty names. The black people were happy because of Junior. Mrs. Davis continued, They were excited about the black players SC had, and knowing someone on the team. It made the blacks feel good, she said. His father was well known. I was well known, and so, by us being raised there, being as our child plays against a white man, people were very happy. Mrs. Davis made the usual case in favor of integration. She celebrated the access that integration had bought, and the chance it offered for athletes like her son to play on the largest possible field, to test themselves against white competition in a fair fight. But in spite of all the clear benefits of integration, the losses sustained by the African American community as a whole went beyond a ball player or two out of this community or that. The community soul was compromised as well. The USC Alabama game began a chain reaction that escalated the African American presence in white southern sports. After the game, one reporter quoted Bryant referring to Davis, saying that he would never again let a great black talent leave the state of Alabama. While the civil rights movement challenged the nation to live up to its founding ideals of liberty and justice, the physical ability of both Cunningham and Davis provided pragmatic evidence that African Americans were needed if Alabama and other southern schools hoped to compete on the national stage. Jerry Claiborne, an assistant coach at Alabama, reportedly said after the USC game that Sam Cunningham had done more for integration in two hours than Martin Luther King Jr. had accomplished in more than a decade. The mentality behind that statement, giving a football player more credit for integration than Dr. King, demonstrated that the basis for integration, in the minds of many white people, was not to embrace equality, but to seize an opportunity for exploitation. Integration in sports, as opposed to integration at the ballot box or in public conveyances, was a winning proposition for the whites who controlled the sports industrial complex. They could move to exploit black muscle and talent, thus sucking the life out of black institutions, while at the same time giving themselves credit for being humanitarians. Integration also exposed white fans to a manner of athleticism and style of play that many had not previously seen. It also introduced a type of showmanship that made the college game appealing to audiences for television's expanding sports programming. The Morgan Grambling game, in which I played in the USC Alabama game, in which Cunningham played on that same afternoon, were snapshots of two realities that were about to undergo transformation. The Civil Rights Movement was a powerful force that clashed with the United States' dominant pressure center and began to pry open previously closed portions of society. The subsequent collision had a shattering effect on the social climate in America. But the force of that collision also shattered the African American community and scattered African Americans in hundreds of different directions. We have been trying to pick up the pieces ever since. The contemporary black athlete expresses the still unresolved consequences of that fracture. There were many positive aspects of integration for African American athletes. There was the opportunity to be educated at prestigious white colleges and universities with all the attendant advantages that those schools bring, larger stadiums, fatter budgets, outstanding training facilities. There was the opportunity to face a wider spectrum of competition on larger stages with access to greater resources. But those opportunities came with a stiff price. In the decades prior to 1970, the oppressive constraints of de facto discrimination imposed a level of solidarity within the black community. Whatever an individual's educational attainments, economic status, 
or excellence on the athletic field, for example, he or she could never entirely escape the oppressive reality of segregation. But with oppression weighing so heavily, any sliver of daylight seemed like relief, even if it ultimately compromised our survival by opening a crack in our solidarity. Integration would give blacks access to that big stage they craved, but it also gave whites access to the black market, to black wallets and sensibilities, and to black talent. Integration also stopped a growing momentum toward independence and self-definition within the African-American community. Integration in the 1970s stifled a movement within the black community toward empowerment and community building that began as a result of African-Americans, including athletes, being forced out of integrated sports society in the 1880s and 1890s. In the process of integration, there was also a psychic loss in that many African-American athletes became estranged from the communities that produced them. In time, many had virtually no understanding of the struggles that carried African-American athletes through sports history. A generation of young athletes born after 1970 assumed that the dominant black presence had not evolved, but rather that it had always existed. Prior to integration, Many Southern-born African-American athletes were forced to attend HBCUs that were close to their homes. This created a family-like atmosphere surrounding black schools. They were as much a part of the community as were the families themselves. There was an enormous amount of civic pride associated with football teams at black colleges. In addition to providing a platform for black athletes, sporting contests at HBCUs reflected special black cultural patterns that attested to both the strength and vibrancy of the black community. This was especially apparent when rival teams would play one another. More than mere games, the contests were an opportunity for the entire community to band together and support their team and celebrate themselves. The Morgan Grambling showdowns were prime examples of this element at work. In addition, Having the black athletes close to home allowed them to serve as role models for their own families, as well as for the entire community. Networks of relatives remained strong because the family members were always close by. After integration, however, black athletes began moving across the country in pursuit of their individual athletic destinies. They often left both their families and extended families behind, and as a result, became alienated from their communities. Many black athletes no longer felt as if the place where they grew up was home. As the profitability of the sports industry, starting at the college level, increased, the disconnection imposed by white institutions on black athletes became more deliberate and pronounced. From the 1880s, when the first African Americans played at predominantly white schools, to the early 1960s, the majority of black athletes who aspired to play at the top level of college football had few options. Although they could play at mainstream schools in the West, Midwest, or East, they faced unwritten quotas that limited the number of black players on a school's roster. In the South, integration came late to the mainstream schools, giving Southern HBCUs the pick of the recruiting litter. Well into the 1960s, Jake Gaither, the legendary coach of Florida A&M, had the first crack at black athletes in the entire state of Florida. Eddie Robinson, the Grambling coach, had the same access in Louisiana. Marino Kasem of Alcorn State and W.C. Gordon of Jackson State shared Mississippi. The general feeling of black officials may have been that white racist attitudes in the South were so deeply entrenched that black colleges would have indefinite access to a rich pool of African-American athletes for decades to come. This unchecked access to black talent fostered a lack of foresight and vision and led to complacency. Why upgrade athletic facilities? Why beef up the athletic department's budget? Why expand? Why instrumentalize athletic programs in ways that so-called mainstream colleges had done for decades? 
using sports to add revenue and boost the reputation of the school, and then invest in upgrading not just the athletic facilities, but the national reputations of entire universities. Presidents, coaches, and athletic directors at the HBCUs would pay a steep price for taking their resources for granted and not maximizing their facilities and competitiveness when they had the chance. The problem was that black coaches, on some level, liked the segregation arrangement. The Achilles heel of those Africans who became entrenched in the slave trade since their initial confrontation with the West was often the failure to plan and predict. Similarly, the failure of black institutions to anticipate and plan came back to haunt them. Apparently, none of the head coaches, athletic directors, or presidents at HBCUs considered what might happen when predominantly white schools in the South got religion and began recruiting black athletes en masse. Over time, inevitably, a growing number of white coaches like Bryant and athletic directors began to realize that their segregated teams could no longer compete successfully against integrated schools. The rest of the nation was using African-American athletes from the South to beat the Southern teams. For example, the Loyola University Ramblers had won the 1963 National Basketball Championship with a team of mostly black starters. In 1966, Texas Western, now the University of Texas El Paso, with an all-black starting lineup, upset Adolph Rupp's University of Kentucky Wildcats to win the national title. Sandy Stevens, an African-American, was the quarterback of the 1960 Big Ten champion Minnesota Golden Gophers. He had led the team to the Rose Bowl. Michigan State won the national championship with a defense anchored by Texans Bubba Smith and George Webster. And now, in 1970, Alabama was being embarrassed at home by a heavily integrated USC team. The realization that integration was necessary to maintain competitiveness was complemented by the fact that integration bore few practical costs for white teams. The key to the ultimate appeal of integration for white coaches was that it would not mean a corresponding loss of power. In essence, whites could have their cake and eat it too. Integration on the sports field would not mean the transfer of power from whites to blacks any more than the black workforce in the cotton fields threatened white control of antebellum plantations. Blacks had not shared in the fruits of their industry then and would not share in it now. But for black coaches and others, exactly the opposite phenomenon occurred. Under the integration arrangement, Many black institutions were either dismantled or downsized. Those educators who had been heads of departments frequently became assistants or were made heads of smaller divisions. Black head coaches became assistant coaches. The old high school became the middle school and the principal from the white high school remained while the principal of the black school became the principal of the middle school. And in sports, the white coaches got the upper-level positions, while blacks got the junior varsity jobs. In what would become a model of the new post-integration sports, blacks at the college level were pushed into prominence for their stellar athletic ability, but were not pulled into the executive and coaching pipeline with equal vigor. This pattern became firmly entrenched as the years went by. The disparity between black presence on the field and representation in the administration was illustrated in a survey by the National Collegiate Athletic Association. The four-year study by the NCAA's Minority Opportunity and Interest Committee, released in 2001, showed a negligible increase in minority group athletic administrations over the years. For example, of 5,889 vacant administrative positions between 1991 and 1994, only 10% were filled by blacks. Such positions typically include administrative assistants, equipment managers, graduate assistants, strength coaches, trainers, coaches, academic advisors, auxiliary services personnel, 
faculty representatives, compliance coordinators, eligibility officers, ticket managers, sports information directors, promotion marketing directors, business managers, and athletic directors. The number of associate and assistant athletic directors, key career paths to upper administration, actually declined between 1991 and 1994. Of 122 new athletic directors hired by predominantly white colleges between 1990 and 1994, 15 were black, according to NCAA figures. Currently, 32 of 897 athletic directors in the NCAA's three divisions are black. Of the 107 Division 1A schools, the big-time football schools, a mere four have black athletic directors. And for all their overwhelming numbers on the field, blacks represent 3.9 of the total number of head coaches in all three divisions. Segregation at the administrative level was a protective tariff for whites. The repercussions of integration went beyond the Negro Leagues and historically black colleges. Prior to the integration of the NFL, there were a number of all-black professional teams that were relatively successful. The first all-black professional team, organized by Fritz Pollard in 1928, was the Chicago Blackhawks. The Blackhawks became well known for playing and beating white professional and semi-professional squads. Another of the more successful all-black football teams was the Brown Bombers of Harlem. Organized by Herschel Rip Day, the Bombers are best known for beating the white Newark Bears in 1936 by a score of 41 to 0. Although the Blackhawks and Bombers were the two best known enterprises, a number of other all black teams were also operating successfully. This success, however, came prior to the integration of the NFL. After the NFL began allowing blacks in, all of the most talented black players left their original teams to join the league. Wharton School of Business professor Kenneth L. Shropshire wrote, Once integration occurred, black sports team ownership completely disappeared. Integration, a godsend for black athletes, was a disaster for black owners who were defenseless even to protest. Similar to the destruction of baseball's Negro League, black professional football organizations stood no chance against the larger and more powerful NFL. With the dissolution of Negro League baseball and the collapse of the fragile football league, blacks would never again have as great a stake in the sports industry and would spend the next five decades trying to regain lost ground. The employment and promotion of African Americans in the sports industry would be an issue in sports for the next 50 years. Almost no one could have predicted the numerous negative ramifications of integration. In fact, some of the most vocal supporters of integration were the same ones who were perilously impacted once it occurred. Even so, and in spite of the evidence pointing toward the overall harm that integration caused in the African American community, there are still many critics who argue that none of these results can be attributed to integration. Furthermore, some maintain that the benefits that individual African Americans have received outweigh the harm that may have occurred to the black community. Although many of these arguments are compelling, they do not fully reckon with the problems that may have been unleashed within the black community because of integration. The next section of this book will begin addressing those problems in detail, but make no mistake, though integration was a major pivot in the history of the black athlete, it was not for the positive reasons we so often hear about. Integration fixed in place myriad problems a destructive power dynamic between black talent and white ownership, a chronic psychological burden for black athletes who constantly had to prove their worth, disconnection of the athlete from his or her community, and the emergence of the apolitical black athlete who had to be careful 
what he or she said or stood for so as not to offend white paymasters. At the same time, it destroyed an autonomous zone of black industry, practically eliminating every black person involved in sports, coaches, owners, trainers, accountants, lawyers, secretaries, and so on, except the precious on-the-field talent. Integration created a multitude of unforeseen problems for the white power structure as well. For one thing, black success in mainstream sports forced the media to recast the long-held stereotypes that rationalized the exclusion of black athletes, that they were physically and mentally inferior to whites. There now had to be a rationale for black dominance. After the 1966 Texas Western game, black success in basketball began to be explained away by a new rationale. Okay, maybe blacks are tough enough and smart enough to beat whites, but that's only because their bodies are so well suited to the game. They can run faster, jump higher. What do you expect? Reintegration of sports also created an insatiable demand for black athletes and the style many of them carried with them to college and pro leagues. This style would be the source of great entertainment and much hand-wringing for white coaches and commentators. But what is African-American style? Where does it come from? What function beyond entertainment does it serve? The gestures that make up black style, the chest bumps, high fives, shakes and shimmies, are more profound than simple mannerisms. Style is a specialized form of black expression a consequence of being outside of or other. From Harlem to Bedford-Stuyvesant to Watts to isolated segregated areas, style grows up fresh and uncut. African-American style is a reaction to racism. Those segregated regions of black life evolve in different ways, resulting in distinctive music, speech, manner, and ways of doing things. The various Negro League teams played by the same rules as their white counterparts, but any spectator could tell they played a different game. Black style is a state of mind, something felt, something seen, and immediately identified as one's own. Ralph Ellison wrote that he and his young friends back in Oklahoma recognized and were proud of our group's own style wherever we discerned it, and jazz men, and prize fighters, ball players and tap dancers, and gestures, inflection, intonation, timbre, and phrasing. What exactly is black style? The answer goes beyond surface gestures and pantomime, deeper than the basket catch, the alley-oop pass, and even the Ali shuffle. The essence of style is connected to something infinitely more powerful than trying to colorfully celebrate a touchdown or slam dunk a basketball. Much deeper, painfully and profoundly so. Ralph Ellison examined the question from another perspective. What would the United States be without the Negro? He wrote, Without the presence of Negro American style, our jokes, tall tales, even our sports would be lacking in the sudden turns, shocks, the swift changes of pace, all jazz-shaped, that serve to remind us that the world is ever unexplored, and that while a complete mastery of life is mere illusion, the real secret of the game is to make life swing.